So with that, we're going to talk about why it may actually be in our best interests for especially Russia and China to have more weapons. Right. So here's our little roadmap. Uh, you know, again, I, I did not know this was going to be recorded, so I, I, you know, sort of slapped some stuff together. Uh, this is this is not. Well, anyway, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about orbital mechanics. So first of all, who here has played Kerbal Space Program? Yes, you are so ready to go. Okay, good. You'll find out later. All right. Um, I know what I'm getting you for your birthday. And all right, we're going to go into a couple of aspects of how orbits work because it turns out that's really important when you're talking about blowing up things that are in orbit. We're going to talk about some of the subtleties of what, a, what an anti-satellite weapon even is. Uh, we're going to go in, who here has heard of Kessler syndrome? OK, yep, you're set. All right, so I've got a ringer here, I'm finding out. Um, so, so good, all right, well then most of the stuff is going to be new to you. That tells me what I need to know. All right, so let's get into, uh, let's get into orbital mechanics. Uh, who here roughly can tell me what an orbit is? Not you. You're, you're banned from answering questions now. Yeah. OK, so two waltzers then don't count, is what you're saying. Waltzers don't count. OK. All right, so gravitation, gravitationally bound. Turns out it's not necessarily circular. You go back to Johann Kepler, he figured out it's an ellipse. Uh, circles a sort of a special case of that. But yeah, pretty much. Most things, most things are in circular orbits. There are a few, few special cases for things like uh, Sybaris satellites that monitor for infrared plumes associated with uh, nuclear launches and such. But so one of the counterintuitive things, oops, sorry. One of the counterintuitive things, for those who are new to orbits, let's say you're in orbit, right? You're high up. Is it safe to tell your, your satellite, just like point your, your thrusters towards the Earth, fire, and give yourself a good old impulse straight that way? Is that safe to do in orbit? Why? What, what happens? What's wrong with that? Uh, orbit is dependent on speed. Uh, yeah, but you're far away. From, you're just making your spacecraft go further away from the Earth. What's wrong? Is there anything wrong with that? It depends on what you want to do with the spacecraft. Is it safe to do it? Is it, is, it? Yeah, is it going to harm the spacecraft? Anybody? That is a good question. All right. Well, it turns out the answer is no. It's probably not safe. All right. This is one of those fun things about orbits, right? So you're, you're going to recognize, the ringer is going to recognize this one right away. Right. You give yourself a nice big impulse here, away, and it changes your orbit in a way you may not have thought was going to happen. Do we have any pilots in the group? OK. You guys know about gyroscopic precession on your propellers, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. So here's the fun part about uh, angular momentum and such is that, and, and this for, for propellers and applies absolutely for orbits as well. You make a change in one place, you thrust in one place, you blow up in one place. You don't actually feel the difference there. The, the change to your orbit doesn't happen in the place you make the change. It happens somewhere else, right? You apply a force on your propeller this way, it turns your plane that way. Right, and we're gonna, we're gonna look into a little bit of what's going on there. So this is something called a Hovman transfer. It, you guys ever hear of this? He talks about Mars, that kind of thing. Uh, you don't have to worry about Hovman versus bioelliptic versus Christochrone or whatever. Just, uh, well you do. You got this little green orbit in here and you add a, a burn. So you're going parallel to the Earth, right? The, the satellite's buzzing along. You take a burn, you do a burn here, and you speed up. And when you speed up, it makes your orbit that yellow ellipse then. Right, so you see, you, you made a change here, but you don't feel the change there. You, the change happens on the other side of the planet, on the other side of the orbit. Then if you want to be in a circle again, you have to do another burn up there at the top, and then you're in that big red circle again. So. Really, the, the number one, there are two points that are worth making here, right? One is it does not change your orbit at the point where you make the change. That's actually really important, right? If you burn, let's say you're at the, the green point, you make that first burn, 
and now you're in the yellow ellipse. You're still passing through that same point in every orbit where you made that burn. So it's a really crucial point when we talk about debris mitigation and management. So absolutely 1,000% recommend this. Play Kerbal Space Program. It's fun. Buy it for your kids and your grandkids. It's amazing. Right? Randall Monroe, who's one of the smartest guys around, is not kidding. Right? <laughs> the part where he really started to understand orbital mechanics was playing that video game. Can I get an amen from the congregation? So, just sort of shilling for KSP there. All right, so those are sort of some of the fundamentals of orbits. Obviously, there's a whole lot there that we didn't cover, but it should get us through this. So next, uh, who remembers their set theory from high school? Yes, okay, so ASAT missiles are a member of the set kinetic anti-satellite weapons, which are themselves a member of the set anti-satellite weapons. That statement makes sense to everybody? All right, well, we'll see. So an anti-satellite weapon, ASAT doesn't mean a missile that goes boom, right? It just means anti-satellite. There are a thousand and one things that have to work on a satellite for it to do its job. You interrupt any number of those things, satellite doesn't do its job. You've succeeded. You've taken out the satellite. If a satellite doesn't have electricity, it can't power any of its systems, it's a big rock, it's a brick. If it can't uh, you know, turn systems on and off, if you interfere with this power distribution unit, it's circuit breaker panel, it's done. If it can't communicate back to Earth, it can't do anything because you can't command it to do anything. You can't get any of the data, you can't get it updates, whatever its last command is, that's what it's gonna do forever, right? Uh, here's a fun one. Satellites have to give off heat. Who saw that one coming? No? Getting blank looks here. What day is today, anyway? Uh, okay, good answer. <laughs> All right, good. Making sure, making sure you're still with me. So in, in, in orbit, as it turns out, there's no, uh, there's no atmosphere, right? And so if there's no atmosphere, there's nothing to give off heat to. There's no mass flow across it. So any heat has to be given off by the good old, you know, black body radiation. It just, it just has to shine it out as infrared, uh, infrared light. So the only way for a spacecraft to cool itself down is to be a light bulb, is to shine light into, the, into deep space. So you make it too hot, it doesn't work. You kill its batteries, it doesn't work. So why do we always talk about ASAT missiles, right? Why is this a thing? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, the whole concept between an anti-satellite missile is you hit it with a rock. Sorry, a rocket, right? Hit it with a rock is a concept we have understood since time immemorial, right? Since, you know, if you actually read the, the paper that's founded on, you know, you look at it, I, I start with like, since, since the day one caveman figured out that or one hominid or whatever, figured out that he could beat another one to death with a stick. We have used application of excessive amounts of kinetic energy as a mainstay in weapons development. This is what we do, guys. I mean, think about it. You know, how many weapons do we really have that go beyond application of kinetic energy? Right, bullets, bombs, of all forms and flavors. Those are all kinetic energy weapons. Right, we start getting into some directed energy stuff with like some non-lethal stuff or maybe to blow up some electronics by overloading them with, you know, gallium, gallium nitride amplifiers and... Still kinetic. It's, it's a little, it's a little, it's closer. It's closer. It, it's in a gray area, let's call it. But also, how many sonic weapons have we really deployed? <laughs> we got some stuff under the sea, but, you know, Still, you look at like the set of all weapons, nearly everything is application of kinetic energy. And if you're trying to overwhelm someone with sonic, it's still kinetic energy, right? You might be generating resonant modes or other fun things, standing waves, uh, but still kinetic energy. So that's one reason. Everybody understands it, or they think they do anyway. Uh, two is that we have these fancy ABM shields that aren't particularly effective at uh, at taking out ballistic missiles, but they can be used to take out satellites. 
So it's a tool we have, and it's a concept we understand intuitively. So this is why we, this is why we see that. Now, it's important to draw a distinction between a direct ascent anti-satellite missile and a co-orbital anti-satellite missile. Who here thinks they can tell me the difference? You in the green shirt. Ah, <laughs> I caught you on your phone. Um, oh, OK. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, what, is, what do you think the difference is between a, a kinetic, or sorry, a direct ascent anti-satellite missile versus a co-orbital anti-satellite missile? No. Who, who else has a guess? Not you. You. Nope. All right, so a direct ascent directly ascends from the Earth and goes boom. So it just goes sort of semi straight up and intersects with the target. Co-orbital is already in orbit. It's already in orbit. And you remember that, uh, that slide where we talked about how to do a Hobman transfer and raise your orbit? It has to do a series of maneuvers to change its orbit such that it, bam, runs into it. So it's co-orbital. So who here knows what the orbital period of a low Earth orbit satellite is, give or take? Oh, oh, oh fine, you. About 90 minutes or so, exactly. Oh, you're right, I put it on there. Fine. Yeah, so you did, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice claim, nice claim. Sure, we'll go with that. So it takes about 90 minutes. So if it's a 90 minutes to go all the way around, it's about 45 to go halfway around, right? So you got a couple of problems there. If you wanna use a co-orbital approach, then it means it's 45 minutes from the time you execute the kill order to the time it intersects if it's on the other side, or you have to be more aggressive when it's closer. And it also means that you have 45 minutes worth of orbital propagation that you gotta get right. right? It turns out the Earth is not actually a perfectly uniform point mass. And we don't build things with perfectly massless and extensible frictionless physics string either. There are gravitational non-uniformities in the Earth. You have gravitational influences from the moon. You have atmospheric disturbances that you have to deal with. The Earth isn't even a sphere, it's an oblate spheroid, right? You remember the whole Newton thing where it fattens at the, at the equator from, from where it's spinning? So you have, it's more dif it can be more difficult to do a co-orbital approach because you have to, it's, it's a harder thing to hit the target and you have a uh, high response latency. Asterisk. What if you had all of the Starlink satellites equipped with thrusters? Well, how long would it take then? Because the Starlinks, there's almost always gonna be a Starlink nearby, right? So now the, the, the time from your kill order to the time of impact is a lot lower, right? So co-orbital co anti-satellite missiles have their pros and cons, right? If you deploy a whole constellation of these bad boys, then you can have some pretty good response latencies. Uh, if you use direct ascent, you get good response latency, but you have to wait until a window of opportunity. So it makes it good and bad. And this, is, of course, is the problem, right? When you have a satellite moving at, oh, let's be generous. Let's pick a nice low speed, 18,000 miles per hour. You hit it with anything, boom, hypervelocity detonation. Right, they, they literally, they just, they go boom. And, you know, you don't actually need explosives on your, on your ASAT missiles. They, they don't have explosives. They have infrared detectors so they can stay on target. Uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that they have. All you have to do is just, just wing it. I mean, these things don't pass the five mile an hour bumper test, right? Now, my, my other talk, Big Risks, I talk about the risks of when you have things like refueling satellites uh, and maybe on final approach for refueling, you just tell it, gun your thrusters full speed. You're not gonna create a massive debris problem, but you will take out the birds. So these are fairly delicate things, and if you hit even a strong thing at 18,000 miles an hour, if you don't have some Whipple shielding, it's gonna be a bad day. So this brings us to a pet peeve of mine. Who here has seen the movie Gravity? Terrible. It was terrible. Do you know one of the biggest reasons it was terrible? 
because it was the Chinese that launched that doggone missile. The Chinese are not the heroes of that stupid movie, those frickin' cowardly people in the studios. The Chinese in 2007 launched, launched a missile that destroyed Feng Yun 1C. It, was, it is arguably a huge mess. It is arguably the most irresponsible action in space to date. And the reason, and, and we'll get into exactly why, but it was, it was the Chinese, those bastards. So, there have been some fun, there have been a lot of things in the past. Some of the more fun ones is that uh, in 1980, I think it's 82, I'm, I'm, I gotta get the date right on that. Back in the 80s, the Soviets actually did something where they, they basically had a grenade. They actually did have a flying bomb. And then it nestled up next to another one of their satellites and went boom, disabling, killing one and disabling the other. So, that is a kinetic de debris generating weapon, right? But it's not a kinetic missile. It was more like a grenade. Um, then, of course, we have the 2007 destruction of Feng Yun 1C, right? The worst thing, worst uh, of the tests. Uh, and there has been a natural collision of, of consequence also. An Iridium satellite struck an old, uh, an old uh, Soviet satellite also. Say what? 14 meters was the estimate? Nice. I haven't been paying attention. The uh, the defunct the NASA satellite did it not have thrusters on board? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the situation, but yeah, it said uh, it was it was yeah, it was somewhere in the southern hemisphere. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, there we also have to start asking questions like where the Russians actually commanding that satellite, was it actually allowed to happen deliberately so they could gather intelligence on the NASA satellite and other fun stuff. Um, all right, and, and in 2019, of course, uh, Mission Shakti, the Indians blew up a satellite. Now, as it turns out, of all of the ASAT tests, the Mission Shakti is actually the most responsible, or least irresponsible, however you want to look at it. All right, Kessler syndrome. Who here has run, heard of the concept of the runaway generation of debris in orbit? Okay, yeah. Who, who here knows how a nuclear bomb works? Oh, come on. Exponential increase. One makes, t one makes two, two makes four, four makes eight. Exponential increase. You have two satellites in orbit. They hit each other, and now you have a thousand pieces. Those pieces hit each other and make even more pieces and more pieces and more pieces. Exponential runaway generation of debris in orbit. Say what? Yeah, exactly. Only, you know, you can't clean it up at the end. So th this is Kessler syndrome. And it was first, uh, first sort of characterized, if you will, by a guy named Donald Kessler. I've actually spoken to Dean Donald Kessler when I was doing research on this. I, I actually did just sort of have the audacity to call him and say hi, and he's actually a really nice guy. Uh, anyway, so ways to sound silly. <laughs> Alternatively, if you want to impress an astrodynamicist at a party, maybe this will help. First of all, who here thinks we should avoid Kessler syndrome? It looks bad on gravity. Okay. So you guys think we should avoid it, right? That's the consensus? We should avoid Kessler syndrome? Yeah, it's too late. We're already in it. The conditions necessary for Kessler syndrome have already been met. That should feel good, right? We're already in the exponential runaway generation of debris in orbit. Sorry, I'm really not making your life easy over there, am I, Rick? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so when you look at the, uh, the original formulations, it depends upon things like uh, mass in orbit, right? How much stuff do you actually have up there? And the answer is we have enough. We have enough already that Kessler syndrome has already started. But then you look at the number of expected collisions per year, and it's like 0.01 or something. Right? Or, you know, time between collisions is still quite high. So we're in the exponential, we're in an exponential increase in, in debris, but the, the number of collisions is still so low that it's not really much of a practical problem. So what, what was my next one here? Uh, mega constellations, right, okay. Mega constellations are a mega problem, right? Not really. Now, can I see, <laughs> sorry, Ken, Rick. Uh, I'll, I'll try to wander around on you a little less. Uh, so, 
you know, we, we have a lot of, you know, scare headlines. Uh, Starlink is going to destroy the world. And, you know, so far as I can tell, it's more of a risk to cell phone companies and to astronomers than it is to satellite operations or personnel in space. And this is for a couple of reasons, right? We, we can't avoid Kessler syndrome. It's too late to avoid it. So what we do is we manage it. We have things like treaties where satellites will naturally passively decay in less than 25 years. We, uh, we have avoidance, we have uh, maneuverability requirements so that if there is a, uh, a predicted conjunction event, that's where two satellites get close to each other, we don't actually know if they're gonna hit, but we, we can tell if they're gonna get kinda close to each other within you know, 24 hours or so. Uh, then you, you have to take avoidance maneuvers, and this is all actually managed by the International Telecommunications Union, among other people. Here in the US, the FCC handles this, or at least they, they did. I think that's been changing lately. Anyway, um, the point is, you know, we manage it. And mega constellations, I mean, for the most part, these things are well-controlled, run by big corporations that have the, uh, the capabilities to, to work with them, and they passively deorbit, and they're often at low orbital altitudes where there's enough atmosphere to kind of drag them down. And I'll, I'll show you guys a graph of that here in a minute. So, all right, next one. Kessler syndrome means no more access to space. Who thinks that one's right? I mean, I've kind of given it away that these are all wrong, right? But uh, let's say the Kessler, Kessler's, you know, nightmarish vision comes true. It doesn't actually eliminate access to space. Space is really, 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 really big. Had to make sure I got the right number of relays in there. Uh, and in addition, uh, we have Whipple shielding. So Whipple shielding is a special kind of like multi-layered shielding that spreads out the kinetic energy. And already we put this on, on things that hold humans. We already use Whipple shielding to protect the humans anyway. We have to. A fleck of paint in orbit at moving at 18,000 miles an hour is enough to, to break a window on ISS, and it has happened. We have had to replace windows on ISS because of things like this. Micrometeorites, flecks of paint, things like that. So we already have to have the shielding. What it does do is it increases the cost of deploying things in orbit, right? So it could make it economically infeasible to do a lot of things in orbit, but. Oh yeah, and finally, Ke ASAP missiles will cause Kessler syndrome. Now again, Kessler syndrome is more about how much stuff you have in orbit. It's less about how many, how many things, right? So even if you had, you know, one tiny CubeSat and one gigantic Death Star, that would be enough, right? Because you have enough mass in orbit, and there is some probability of there being a collision, and when that little CubeSat hits the Death Star, you have more pieces. Those pieces will eventually collide and make more pieces and so on and so forth. So, Again, Kessler's all about how much stuff you have, how much, not how many. And ASAT missiles don't really add a substantive amount of additional mass, right? What they do is they act as a time shift operator. They move you a little bit further into this dark future by, by causing one of those collisions to happen, increasing the number of pieces of debris, and thereby increasing the probability of the next one, or rather decreasing the expected wait time to the next one. To do. Should have had one of those little clicker things. Um, yeah, like I said, I didn't have visuals for all the things here. Yeah, so what's really important, and I mentioned this a couple times earlier, is that uh, don't read the text, that's for me. It's, it's, I know it's terrible form to put text on a slide and, and then say eyes up front, because it just never works. Um, <laughs> when, you, uh, when you make a change to an orbit, the, the piece will always pass through the place where the change happened. So, you hit something with an anti-satellite missile, wherever it goes boom, all of those fragments in their new crazy orbits will pass through more or less that same spot. So, this is why altitude of a test is so important. The altitude of impact is like the main thing that we can control. We can talk about whether it's a hypervelocity head-on impact or a sneaking up from behind impact or if it's a, a downward angle or an upward angle, but the number one most important thing is that it be at a low orbital altitude. Because the atmosphere doesn't, it doesn't just like go up and obligingly stop, right? You don't get up to the von Karman line and then all of the oxygen molecules are like 
well, uh, you know, have a good day. We're going to stay on this side. No. It kind of peters out. It changes in character. But you still have some atmosphere up there. So the reason ISS is at the orbit it is, the reason it's at a, about 450-ish kilometers, is that at, that at that altitude, it can stay in orbit for a little while, but it's as low as it can be to protect from radiation. So low Earth orbit is kind of defined by like as low as we can go before the atmosphere drags you down too quickly, such that it's economically inviable. And so you look at the sort of, so on the x-axis here, this is something I pulled long ago from Planet Labs. You look at the x-axis, and this is the, the number of years it's going to pass, one of their little CubeSats would passively orbit. Uh, no changes, just, you know, it does its thing. Um, and on the, on the y-axis, you have the, the orbital altitude. So you see that, like, as we go, if we, if we want an orbit of five years, we need to be at about, you know, what is that, 500 kilometers, right? But if you want to be at an or if you want 25 years, you only have to go up to 700. So now, and you see how that slope is going, right? It's really shallow. If you want to climb another, if you want to climb another 100, uh, 100 kilometers to get to 800 kilometers, I don't know, 100, 200 years? I don't know. It's way the heck out there, right? That's why a low orbital altitude is so important. That's what was so responsible about the mission Shakti test that the Indians did, and so irresponsible about Feng Yun-1C that the Chinese did. Feng Yun-1C happened at 850 kilometers. Imagine where 850 kilometers is on that chart. Exactly. Exactly. 850 kilometers, it's way the hell out there. That's the bad side of the room. So, next up, I want to do a sort of, uh, as far as I can tell, novel breakdown of the military and political incentives around anti-satellite missiles, or rather specifically anti kinetic anti-satellite weapons. Right? And the reason I do, that, do it this way is that looking at, I'm doing okay on that, good. Um, looking at the incentives provides some clues about things that we can do to try and address, any, address this issue. So again, as far as I can tell, this is the only, this is the only breakdown of its form of, of, of the incentive structures, right? So that's, that's what we're going to look at, right? Will they, won't they? Will they be used? The first question is, are these things really a risk of use, right? Who here is afraid that they're going to get nuked tomorrow? OK, most people answer no. And the reason is that the world understands the consequences of a nuke. And as a result, we've put in governance structures. We've have built entire systems and societies around the concept of, you nuke us, we nuke you, therefore nobody's going to nuke. Mad. It's mad, but it works. Ish. Mostly. We're still here. Quit complaining. All right. First of all, who here has watched The Expanse? Of course you have. It's amazing. I know. I just, I, I just love it. I, I don't know. I've lost track of how many times I've watched that on doing boring exercise or something. Uh, yeah. So uh, first reason why people would use kinetic anti-satellite anti -satellite weapons. Now remember, I'm talking about kinetic weapons. This could be flying bombs. It could be bullets. The Russians actually did put a machine gun on a satellite at one point. Uh, you know, it could be bullets. It could be co-orbital missiles. It could be direct ascent missiles. Any kinetic approach to killing. Why are we afraid of people using it? Because it freaking works, guys. Kin application of kinetic energy is a fundamental physical principle that is not going away anytime soon. We know how to do this. We know it works. And yeah, if you are in, if you're in, a, if you're in combat, <coughs> excuse me. Let's say that uh, you know something totally outside the realm of feasibility happens and NATO goes to war against Russia and China. So let's say that NATO starts winning in, or NATO and Five Eyes, I guess, whatever. Uh, yeah. So let's say that we're winning, we're winning in, a, in a conventional war, but one of the uh, commanders who has access to the Nudol weapon, the Nudol missiles in Russia, says, I am losing this. I'm losing this battle. 
because of intelligence provided by this, this asset, this bird, or because of communications enabled by Starlink or something like that. And he says, well, I have access to these 100 missiles here. Take out those satellites, please. Why would he want to do that? Because it would work. Because it would neutralize a strategic capability that his adversary has. So, okay. It's a reason to, reason to use it. Another reason to use kinetic ASAT weapons, there's not a lot else to do. Maybe they have some cyber attacks that can pwn some satellites, but when you start getting into the, the big boys, like a, you know the, the Grumman's, the Lockheed's, that kind of thing, you have some pretty serious type two NSA cryptography governed by CNSSP 12, which you know is a, an acronym soup that basically means they take cybersecurity pretty seriously. The odds of getting fully pwned to the point where you could actually take the asset off the board with a cyber attack, pretty low. Not to mention the fact that you're probably gonna fire your cyber attacks right at the beginning and either the systems recover and patch the vulnerabilities and your zero days are now gone or they don't recover, but either way, you know, it's probably gonna happen early. It's probably not gonna be that effective against the national security birds. So there's not a lot else to do. You can do some, some jamming. You can do some laser dazzling for, uh, for some types of systems. Yeah, maybe it works a bit, but maybe it doesn't. But you want to take that asset off the board, you want to actually fully disable it permanently, hit it with a rock. That's all you got. And finally, why do, we, why do I think they might be used in combat? Because who the hell is going to stop them? Right? Remember that conversation about nukes, how we know how the world would respond if one country nukes another? Right? We've been pretty crystal frickin' clear about this, and it's good that we're crystal clear about this. And if you haven't seen Dr. Strangelove, then you know, go watch it and you'll understand why it's important that it be crystal clear. If you don't know the consequences of using a nuke, then you, can't you cannot restrain yourself from doing so. This is why we have governance structures. Now, of course, it doesn't work if you elect a complete you know, whack job, but you know, it's something at least. This is why these governance structures exist. And granted, Putin could probably override it, and there's a whole, if you've never read the Dictator's Handbook, by the way, wonderful, wonderful book. But, uh, you know, there's a whole question of, like, how much civilian oversight really means and such, but still, we put c command and control safeguards into the military, we have civilian oversight, we have response policy, we have governance structures that prevent the use of nuclear arms. We don't have that same kind of stuff for anti-satellite missiles. And in a lot of ways, ASAT missiles are fairly similar to, to nukes. Um, and especially now that Russia's talking about you know, actually using nukes for EMP weapons to take out spacecraft, which, you know, that's a whole nother can of worms. But, uh, you know, you, you, why do we actually fear nukes? Why do you think we, we actually don't want nukes deployed on Earth? It would start to probably be an answer for a long time. I mean, I don't think we have enough nukes to kill everyone in the opening salvo, so why do we care? Uh, forget the opening salvo. Even if, if all nukes were deployed, I don't think we have enough to, to kill all the humans. I don't think we're quite to bender yet, but, you know. The effects. Have. The effects. It's those, those, those lingering effects, those long-lived effects of fallout, radiation, nuclear winter. That is why we worry about nukes. I mean, yeah, you kill a crap ton of people when you bomb things, but still. We're not quite as worried about conventional weaponry or even chemical weaponry that kills the same number of people because it can go away pretty quickly. So you throw a bunch of anti-satellite missiles up. How long until that debris goes away? Has some similar properties, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna draw a, a full-on equivalence here, but it does have some similar properties. They're both strategic weapons. They both need governance structures. They both should have these same response policies, et cetera. So, all right, so this brings us to all right, what the hell do we do about this? This is the part where I have to be a little bit careful since we're filming. Um, I think I ran out of, uh, oh yeah. So first thing we do, we can make them less effective, right? The first reason we, we worry about people using these in, in combat, and by the way, for what it's worth, the consensus in the community of like 
five people in the world that are really experts in this field, it's that, yeah, it's a risk. It is a real risk, so, all right. It's a risk because they're useful. They get the job done. So one mitigation strategy is make them less effective. And there are a couple of ways that you can do this, right? Divide and hide. You can, so when I say divide, I mean switch from large single sort of strategic assets that are half billion dollars each to constellations of little satellites. Now we've been seeing this happen naturally, right? So sort of like how we saw, you know, computing commoditized where we went from, you know, the single, the single mainframe server to this, this whole rack of these little servers, right? We're seeing similar things happen in the space industry already. So, you know, if you, you think about the mainframe days, right? If your mainframe goes down, that's it. You're, you're not doing anything until you get it back up. If one of your nodes in a compute cluster goes down, you're down one node, who cares, right? You wanna add 10% more capacity, guess what? You're buying a whole new mainframe. You wanna add 10% more capacity to your compute cluster, add 10% more machines. So you have better resilience, better scaling, better economics, better upgrade paths, all sorts of fun stuff. And it turns out that the same is more or less true in orbit, right? We go from these, these massive half billion dollar projects to these, uh, these constellations of little satellites. And you know, a lot of this was driven by these things. Right? Trillion dollars worth of research allowed us to do all sorts of useful stuff with something this size. We built, mic we built smaller ICs, we built power amplifiers and RF components, software-defined radios, all allows us, you know, cameras that are tiny, it all allows us to do useful things in smaller satellites. So that's one thing you can do, right? If you have, uh, you know, let's, uh, a hundred million, a $10 million missile or a hundred million dollar missile or whatever, depends on what na nation you're in. Uh, do you want to use that to take out a $1 million satellite? Maybe, but it really changes the economics and it means that you have to have a massive fleet of these missiles. Now the problem with this approach is that all of the incentives or all of the technological advantage, advances and such that make it easier to launch these constellations, of small satellites, also make it easier to launch things like co-orbital missiles. So the, it sort of carries with it the seeds of its own demise there. But still, disaggregation is the sort of official term if you want to impress somebody to party again, disaggregation. Um, something else about, oh yeah, and hiding, right? So you can use stealth satellites, for example. Uh, I think in the paper I actually do a, 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 an SNR budget, a, a, a signal to noise ratio budget for like, what temperature do you need to make the exterior of your satellite to hide from the infrared cameras on American anti-satellite inter interceptors? You know, things like that. So, you know, you can hide with, with RF stealth and with uh, infrared stealth, but you know, stealth. All right, so this is the part where I'm, I'm gonna stay very close to uh, what's in the paper. Uh, one of the rather annoying things about the United States is our classification system. I am not associated with any military, any company, any academic institu institution, nor have I ever been, uh, and I do not hold clearance. So when I first approached DARPA, rederiving this stuff on the back of a napkin from first physical principles, uh, the response was, stop talking, we're not on a secure line, get to a skiff and call me back. I said, well, I don't have clearance. And it's like, yeah, we, we're just never gonna talk. <laughs> So I am of the opinion that if you can rederive it from first principles on the back of a napkin, it really should not be classified. But um, anyway, so, so here we are. So ways that you can kill a satellite uh, without causing these problems, without generating debris, or safe kills, as I call them in, my pa in the paper, right? EMP is one way. The problem, of course, is that generating EMP still more or less requires that whole nuclear bomb thing, and Copuous, among other things, has a few things to say about that. Um, so, you know, yes, EMP will do it. Of course, one problem is that if you send off an EMP in orbit to kill satellites, you're also gonna effectively EMP the nation, at which point that whole nuclear response starts happening. Somebody sends off a high altitude EMP crippling our nation, yeah, I'm pretty sure we would have a nuclear response to them. So, okay. Yes, that does count, but probably not quite as useful as we might want. So, all right, ways that you can politely kill a satellite. Uh, 
you remember we talked about a, hundred, a thousand and one things that had to go right? One of them is that ha they have to stay cool, right? They're sitting there in the sun with no atmosphere to cool them down. So uh, this, they all work by shining out their heat into deep space. And this depends upon the, uh, something called the absorptivity emissivity ratio, right? How much of the energy, how much of the power from the sun does it absorb? as compared with how much of that energy that it has does it then radiate in space. And so what you could do is you could muck about with its absorptivity emissivity ratio. So they actually have radiator panels on ISS whose whole job is just to shine out heat into deep space. That's all they do. So one thing you could do is you could essentially put paint over those. And yes, this can be done in orbit with off-the-shelf parts. Uh, physical vapor deposition of metal ions is the ideal way to do this because it has, like, all of the attacks can be done with physical, with PVD deposition of, um, of metals. You know, so you change that, and now their thermal budgets are dropped. So you know how computers get hot and they have to have fans to cool them down, right? So if you, if you want to run your CPU just doing, you know, very little, it doesn't get very hot. You know, your CPU fan doesn't, doesn't turn up very high. But the moment you start really tur turning that thing on and really doing a lot of hard work, that fan goes faster. So that's, that's sort of a thermal budget, if you think about it, right? If the, if the satellite wants to do stuff, every watt that it consumes, more or less, turns to heat. Every watt its CPUs, every watt of its, just about every watt of its power amplifiers, I mean, the amplifiers are like 10% efficient. You know, maybe you get 30%, but like, the vast majority of all the power it consumes just turns into heat, and it has to be radiated. You eliminate the ability to shed heat. You eliminate the satellite's ability to do stuff. So physical deposition of metal ions on the surface does that. You can do it on radiator panels. You can do it on the spacecraft body. You can do it on the solar panels and include the solar panels. You get to lambda by two, and suddenly you can't see through it anymore. Now they don't have as much available energy from, from their solar panels. Using these same uh, physical, va physical uh, vapor deposition systems, you could also short out their antennas, right? So now they can't talk to the ground. You could cover up lenses on sensor systems or other sensor systems. Now they can't see anything. You could do it just a little bit so that the resolution available to their sensor systems is not what it was. It gives you this whole sliding scale of things that you could do, starting with rendezvous and proximity operations, right? Once you get to the point where you can nestle up next to that satellite for a moment and do some stuff, gives you all sorts of options. Hmm? Oh, sorry, orbital security lines. I'll get to that in a second. I, it, it's, I was working on solving the uh, problem with uh, cybersecurity in the space industry and also deploying a weapons constellation at the same time. Um, you can lead a national defense person to, to national defense, but you can't make them care. Anyway, um, so, you know, these are things you can do. Uh, you can have your, your rendezvous and proximity operation satellites go up next to the bird and just block it on all sides so they can't maneuver, right? Just block them in. You can embargo that satellite. You can use one satellite to occlude their view of the Earth. So there are all sorts of things that you can do to disable or destroy effectively that satellite that don't generate debris. And here's the fun part. We're doing this because there are no other options, right? But the people we're actually worried about, worried about here, it's not the US, it's not us, right? It's not us, it's not the Indians for the most part. It's Russia and China specifically. So ironically, it's actually more important for our enemies to have these weapons than us. All right, so I'm just going to ask you to play out two scenarios. And let me know by show of hands or, or whatever which one you think is less bad. Scenario one, we go to war with Russia and China, and they don't have these weapons. Scenario two, they do have these weapons. Which one plays out better for us? Show of hands, who thinks it, it, it plays out less bad if they have the weapons? All right, some people are not sold. Maybe, maybe. What about you guys? Hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Kinetic and debris generating weapons. That's it. That's all they'd have. They'd have some lasers, 
that can sometimes work if, uh, sometimes they can be useful if the satellite is in view of one of their la ground-based lasers. They can do some jamming that can temporarily disrupt communications, but not from like further field relay satellites or if they're using laser comms, it's harder depending upon, you know, asterisk, asterisk, asterisks. There are a few minor alternatives, but if they want to take something off the board, make that satellite go bye-bye, pretty much down to anti-satellite missiles. And finally, final recommendation is that nobody's going to stop you. So, you know, and again, sorry, I don't have any graphics for this last bit here. Let's put some governance structures in place, right? Let's have NATO, I mean, NATO has a, a space policy about what defines an Article 5 violation, uh, but it's classified. Um, and, sorry, I didn't make that choice. I know, it's disappointing. Um, you know, we can put out statements of the form, you, you attack with, uh, with these missiles, we invade your country. Right? Now, you have to balance that, of course, with things like nuclear deterrence and such, but still, you know, we can start putting out policies, response policies. We can put in our own CNC command and control safeguards. Right? Make sure that only the right people have access to launch these things, and those people actually are informed about the consequences of it and the utility of it. We can, you know, what else do I have? You know, we can have civilian oversight in these things. Again, it's questionable about the utility of civilian oversight. A lot of asterisks on a lot of these things, but still, these are the sorts of things that we could do. And finally, you know, oh, oh yeah, and de-escalation hotlines, right? There should be a, a method by which, you know, when we get to the point where somebody wants to trade ASAT missiles with us, that we can de-escalate. Right. These things, these these sorts of things exist for nuclear weapons. We know how we know what works in this arena and what doesn't. So let's borrow from the lessons that we have learned from nuclear weapons and apply them here. So finally, one fun thought: these things aren't going anywhere. No matter what anybody in this room or anybody else anywhere does, kinetic anti-satellite weapons are here to stay. In fact, they're only going to grow. We start building space hotels, guess what? There's gonna be more orbital weaponry, right? We have disaggregated constellations, but you can't even always do disaggregated constellations, right? Some things like hyperspectral imaging due to the, due to the physics of it, when, you know, when, you're, when you're counting photons, you don't have much of a choice but to use a big, uh, a, a big lens. You know, sometimes you can't, but as we build disaggregated constellations, we're gonna find ways to blow them up more efficiently. It's too effective, guys. Application of kinetic energy is just too effective. It's gonna, it's gonna be here to stay. So, when Kamala Harris comes out and says, we are putting forth a proposal to the UN to, let's see if I can count the number of layers of uselessness here, ban the testing of direct ascent anti-satellite missiles. That's three layers of uselessness. And even with those three layers of uselessness, it still got shot down by Russia and China at the UN, right? Why is it layers of uselessness? Well, first of all, you're banning, you're only talking about anti-satellite missiles that are launched directly from the Earth, and you're only talking about banning the testing of them. Three layers of uselessness, and even that got nowhere. So guys, these are here to stay. So what can we do about testing? It's important, like, with nuclear weapons to manage it. So for example, one strategy that, that I, I sort of have put forward, uh, my two cents worth, I don't know, proposed, I guess. Uh, if you do something like have a, uh, a quota system, right, each nation is allowed to have a certain number of pieces of debris that they are allowed to generate from testing. You go over that quota and here is the response, right? We, we start with economic sanctions, blah, 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 and it just sort of ratchets up until you're North Korea. And uh, number of pieces of debris, it's easy to count. It's really easy to count the number of pieces of debris. All the, most of these governments can do it themselves. Commercial organizations can do it, right? It's easy to do. It, it would be better if we had something like, you're not allowed to, you know, change the mean wait time between natural collisions by more than a day or something like it would be cool if we could do that but you know do you think anyone's ever going to agree on which model to use to make that determination no number of pieces of debris above a certain size or what have you 
is something that we can quantify and track easily. So we can put in governance structures. That's about all we can do. Those are the only three mitigations I found. Now there's one final question I gotta ask. Oh yeah, some recommended reading here. I can send it out later if you want. One thing I gotta ask. Who here thinks I'm full of shit? You should be asking that question. Isn't, seriously, is nobody asking that question? Eh, better swindler than I thought. So I honestly don't know if I'm full of it. Like I said, there are like five guys in the world that, that I, I think are, are really able to have this conversation. Uh, you know, there's like Dr. Bezo Nal, she's, uh, she's of the UN now, I think. Uh, you know, Brian Whedon over at Secure World Foundation. But even that is, is problematic. It's like the Secure World Foundation, their whole thing is disarmament. <laughs> so try having a conversation with a guy whose company has a strict mandate of disarmament about whether or not it's actually better to have more weapons. <laughs> That's kind of a conflict of interest. But for what it's worth, Every, all of these experts that I've spoken to uh, either agree with these conclusions or at the very least are like, honestly, I don't know, but this is a good debate to have. And that's actually kind of my bar for what I would have wanted out of this. It's a good debate to have. And, you know, of course, somebody should build out the weapons constellation that I was talking about because it can be used for commercial uh, purposes as well. Uh, with dual-use technologies that you can buy off the shelf today, and also it would solve the problem of space cybersecurity for like 80% of the cases anyway. But that's another story. So there we have it. Hopefully this bright and sunny day is a little bit gloomier for you. Cheers, guys. <laughs>